Are you a business owner stuck in fear, doubt, and worry about what the marketplace will look like in the future? Then this show is for you. Strap on your seatbelt and get ready to disrupt and innovate. Here's your host, Lisa Levy. I am so excited to introduce to you today, Brian Mattimore. He is the co-founder and the chief idea guy at The Growth Engine Company, an innovation agency with clients among the top one-third of Fortune 500's top 100 companies. He's an expert in applied creativity, ideation facilitation, and innovation management. He's led over 1,000 marketing, sales, and business strategy ideation sessions and managed more than 200 successful innovation projects, amounting to over $3 billion in new sales. He's a sought-after keynote speaker, action learning trainer, and the author of multiple books on creativity, ideation, and the innovation process. I think it's obvious why he's here with us today to talk about disrupting and innovating. Brian, welcome to the conversation. Well, thank you, Lisa. You know, when I hear my intro, I sort of get tired because <laughs> it seems like a lot of work, right? I mean, gosh, you know, a thousand ideation sessions, 500 focus group, 200 keynotes. But but the good thing about it is that, that, that there's the learning and the fun and the joy of the moment. So maybe I shouldn't feel tired, but inspired, I guess. Well, let's let's go with being inspired. And you know, that's that formal bio that we read to set up you as a as a credible guest, which yeah. you are, right? But that's not what's interesting to my audience. They want to know who you are, the journey that you've been on, and really what brought you to what you're doing today. Will you take us on that journey? Sure. Thank you. You know, I grew up in a entrepreneur entrepreneurial, idea-oriented household. My dad was a madman, worked in advertising and 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 you know, championed ideas. And one of his ideas, he created the second largest research firm under the auspices of Time Incorporated. It was called Sammy. He named it after our dog. And I named the dog an English setter. So I, I take credit for naming that company. But that was the environment I grew up in where ideas were championed and loved. And, and so I, I, you know, early on in my life, I'm like, well, how do you get ideas? You know, where do they come from? How do you get them? And so that's really been my lifelong passion to understand that. And not only for myself, because I found that I could generate ideas after some trying different ways, but really helping others to get ideas. And, 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 and in a sort of a meta way, I don't know if you would call it the highest way, but you know, trying to understand the processes that would allow others to generate ideas. And so that's been my, you know, my path and my journey, and, and, and I love it. And I'm always inventing new approaches, new methodologies in terms of, but what do you do with that? You know, what do you, what do, you do? Print up a card that says ideas and go out in the world? Well, no, that, I tried that, by the way, and that didn't work. <laughs> but, you know, early on, after, after I got, I was a psychology major at Dartmouth, and after I, after I got out of school, you know, I was writing ad copy, any, anything to survive. I got a job in new product development. And, and by the way, for your listeners, I don't know if this is still true, but it was certainly true for me at the time. One of my major goals was to find mentors. You know, I was, that was much more than money or title or credentials. It was, can I find somebody that I think is, is brilliant and can teach me? The first mentor I had was Bud Johnson. He, had, he and his team had created Legs Pantyhose, which was really fun to work with him. And the second, well, first mentor was my dad, of course. But then the, the third mentor was Gene Whalen, and they had a new product development agency. He had been a creative director at ssc and and a brilliant copywriter. And so he taught me how to write. So that was my experience. And then I was freelancing. And then, you know, again, but the whole time I'm researching ideas, how do people get ideas, studying the lives of great inventors, you know, and great creative people in history, identifying their processes, and then starting to write about them. And so Success Magazine uh, asked me to write some articles. I ultimately became a contributing editor for them which was really fun because I got to interview, you know, world-class experts on these things, even though I had my own ideas. And then I, I remember, I, maybe it was an article I wrote, but an editor at uh, Amacom contacted me and said, you know, this is, oh, I know it was an interview for sales and marketing management. And how do you get salespeople to more, be more creative? Okay. And by the way, I had never thought about that. So I came up with the ideas the night before the interview. I mashed up creative process with sales. 
That led to a national article. And then an editor at Amacom saw that and said, asked me if I'd write a book about it. And now I'm really in trouble, right? <laughs> you know, and, and I, you know, not that I couldn't have written a book, but I said, why don't I write a more general creativity book? And she said, great. And so that was the first book, 99% Inspiration. Amacom, American Management Association, picked it as their membership offering. And so they mailed it to fit their 52,000 members. You know, they paid me for the right to do that. And, and from that, that, that's what led to leading 100 ideation sessions a year for many, many years. And one of the things that you talked about in, in your journey that I think we're going to dig into more is the idea that innovation is actually a process, right? There, there, is, there are formulas and there's not one right formula and it is not pure magic. And so I think we can dig into that a little bit more, but I wanted to just highlight that for our listeners because, right, we talk a lot about things here, right, that being disruptive as a leader or is making a choice to challenge the status quo to drive for a positive impact. Yeah. And that activity is the foundation to innovate. Yeah, and I, as you're talking, Lisa, I should probably make the distinction between ideation and innovation, right? Because ideation is coming up with ideas and, and just to finish my own journey, you know, uh, you know, eight years or, of doing 100 sessions a year, at some point you figure out how to run and design and facilitate an ideation session, right? And this is not just for new products. It could be cost cutting or supply chain, anytime there's a creative challenge, if you will. And so then in 99, I formed a growth engine with my lead client at Unilever, uh, Gary Fraser. He had been named uh, Marketer of the Year for Brand Week. And so we formed Growth Engine with the notion that not only would we generate ideas for clients, run ideation sessions, but also innovate, help them innovate. And that involved qualitative research, you know, focus groups kind of stuff and working with their, their manufacturing teams, everybody in the organization to help them be successful uh, innovating new ideas. All right. So and that gets to your notion of process and, and our bias when we would go into clients you know, some, I hope the McKinsey's and, and uh, Accenture's of the world don't take offense to this, and they shouldn't. But some, you know, some organizations go in and say, here's the process, you know, and go ye, go ye innovate, <laughs> you know, and, and we don't, we don't do that. We go in and say, give us a divisions that are underperforming, a brand that needs to be reinvigorated. We will run our process, our ideation, our approaches, get some successes. And from that, we will build your innovation process. It's really from the ground up. And I think that's important because, first of all, they know their business a lot better than we do. Secondly, from a political standpoint, if you go in and say, here, go do this, and we're brilliant and you're not, that's not going to work. I mean, that, frankly, uh, I don't want to say almost never, it almost never works. I, we want them to be our partners in this process and develop the processes that work for their unique culture, their unique organization, and frankly, their unique industry. Because every industry has different constraints. And, you know, if you're innovating in the world of pharma, you know, young children will die if you screw up. And so therefore, you have to be very conscious of the fact that you know, they need to be very, very anti-risk. You need to be so sensitive to that. On the other hand, you understand that at some point we have to get beyond that. And so anyway, so that's that's our approach with, with Growth Engine or Innovation Agency is, is really an inductive, you know, working from the bottom up approach. And we can and get I, more specific on that if you want to, but go yeah, ahead. And, and we might play with that a little bit, but I think that it's really important to, you know, to reiterate, right, that it, the process begins with ideation and how you formalize and go through that then in terms of understanding, and I'm going to use different language here, voice of the customer, right? Understanding what the product service needs to be, understanding what limitations may exist in the business, but we want to ideate, we want to experiment, and we want to use the things that work. It, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up, you know, the voice of the customer stuff, because the dilemma that we always have when we start a new project is, do we do research first or do we do ideation first? And they go, they're hand in glove because, you know, if you ideate well, you can use those ideas as a way to get insights into what people want. 
that you can't get any other way. You know, if you go and say, here's an iPhone, what do you think? It's very different than say, what do you want, you know, in your life? You can't, you know, it's that Henry Ford thing, right? You know, people wanted a, a faster horse, not a car, right? So, so we're all, it's always like, you know, how much research, customer and consumer research has the company done? And if they've done a lot of that, then we can almost immediately start ideating and then iteratively do more research. But if they haven't, you know, we'll want to go talk to consumers. You know, I remember a project we did, this was for, for Danaher Tools. They, they make the Craftsman Tools for Sears. And this was a huge challenge. It's a huge business, first of all, which was amazing to us because Sears at the time was offering, you know, lifelong guarantees of these products. If you broke it or, you know, whatever, they replace it. And we're saying, how do they sell $300 million of ratchets, wrenches, and sockets, sockets, <laughs> ratchets, wrenches, and sockets? Oh, my. You know, how do you, how do you sell those each year? And so we, um, we, we did a tremendous amount of research talking to, the, the point was to talk to different consumers. We will often talk to very sophisticated, you know, professional users at the beginning to help educate us and them, actually. You know, we would talk to segments, whether they were tuners or, or moms who said, you know, I want my old tool, tool set. Don't, don't touch my tools. Or guys who were repairing motorcycles or boats or whatever. And, and so from that, then, then we, we would do, you know, folk, we call focused ideation because mm -hmm. now we know the guard rails we know what we're ideating against, and we have the sense that we begin to get an intuition about what we think winners might be. You know, a, a good example, just, and I'll finish this story, was, you know, there was a, an, a notion for a laser etch socket, right? And the notion was that you could laser etch these sockets so that the size would be much bigger, right? So, you, so you're under the car, you could actually read the size. Is that a seven eighths or a three quarter? You know, no, it, it and so, we brought that out to groups, and this is iterative, right? You start with, I, you know, research, ideation, research, back and forth, back and forth, and that's why our, our our success rates were so high because you go back and forth enough. At some point, you say we really got something here. Anyway, so we brought this to consumers, and the the buyer at Sears said they're not going to pay twenty percent more, ten percent more for these laser edge sockets because it's you know it makes it much more expensive, and they're not going to do that. Well, we went to the groups, the consumer's like, I don't care about that 10 or 20%. I want to be, a, give me this damn thing, you know? And so to the buyer's credit, he said, wow. And he changed his, his approach immediately. And they launched it, you know, within months of, of having seen those groups. So if we stand back here and talk about innovation process, you want everybody that's going to do this thing involved in the research because you want them to have the, the eureka moments and, and breakthroughs that we're having, rather than us going say, no, 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 consumers are really like it. No, it's, it's, it's a whole different experience if, if, if that person is in the back, you know, watching this, they get excited too. And, and as one of our clients said to us, a different client, they said, you know, this helps me sharpen my gut, which I thought was a great comment. Right. That I'm is going on and on. Forgive me, I'm going on and on here, but you know. You oh, it's a great started. story, but <laughs> yeah. I actually I love the. It helps me sharpen my gut because yeah. we all. I'm overgeneralizing, but many of us actually are intuitive decision makers, and are, we follow our gut instincts. Yeah. But when our gut instinct is supported by some fact and some behavioral data, right? And we've, we've sharpened our gut. It does make decision-making happen easier with a higher level of confidence that it's just not, I feel this is gonna work out well. You know what it else? What else it does? We've seen this over and over again. It helps the senior manager sell these projects internally. If we're talking about new products here, we, uh, you know, with Thomas's, I'll just quickly tell the story. We were their, their innovation agency, you know, nooks and crannies, right? English muffins, but all, all the, you know, bagels and all their products. So anyway, so one of the obvious idea was a healthier English muffin, hearty grains, right? Not white, but brown English muffins. And you bring that to the board and the board says, whoa, we've been making white English muffins for a hundred years. Ah, I don't think we want to make a brown English muffin. Ah, but but because the general manager, a fantastic innovation guy that we were working with, had been to the groups, had seen the, you know, the excitement of younger millennials and that they were willing to margin up the business, right? It was, 
you know, you know, but, but the white English muffins, you know, freezer stack, you know, buy, you know, they're on sale about ten, buy ten of them, you know. But because they were healthier, we knew that uh, we could margin up the business and not necessarily have to put them on deal. So, uh, so therefore, when he went to the board, he was so passionate about this product, even though there was resistance, of course, right, because it was such a you know, a change for them that he sold it and, and it became, it became like 30% of their business because it's, it was, it was such a desired product and they could margin up the business. So that's a really good example of, of how we think about innovation process. And, and the fact that yes, disruption freaks people out. And so you, you need to help them feel confident about, about what they're doing, you know, I have other tricks on how to sell stuff internally, but we can get to that if you want. So, Well, and one of the things that you're not saying explicitly, but I think that if I, I use these words, it'll resonate for you, right? As these new ideas are coming and being developed and we're selling them to the board and to the leadership, right? You're taking them on an organizational change journey, right? We are going from the way we've always done it yes. to a future state that's different and change is scary. Yes. Uh, we had one client, I would, I will not give his name, but he said, and we're like, when are you going to launch this thing? Come on. And he said, oh, you get in trouble when you launch stuff. And so he was an innovation guy and he was trying to figure out how not to launch things because they, you know, they can fail. And of course, in CPG world, package goods world, and, and, and even in other worlds too, that we've worked in, you know, you get failure rates of 80 or 90%, right? You know, our failure rates were about, or six, let's call it the success rates were close to 70% because we were really pushing, if you will, this iterative approach. And again, it, and if and and you but you, the key is if again we're, we're focused a lot on new products here it could be anything strategies cost cutting whatever but you know you have to in a new product you have to get the price and the promotion and the positioning and the packaging and all that stuff has to come together and if you mess up one of those i.e. the price it's not going to work and and so this requires a great deal of iterative testing which is antithetical to the current way of doing business, you know, quicker, faster, better. Well, yeah, there are methodologies that can research it much quicker than there used to be beyond conventional focus groups. But, but boy, you need to, you still need to do the work because, you know, we, we all think that we're brilliant, but uh, consumers will tell us how, you know, and customers will very quickly tell us that we're missing something. And, and, and that could be the thing that kills it. Well, and so in that, right, we are trying to do, do more faster Yes. and being innovative. And in a world where we have technology disruptions and things that are presenting themselves, there are tools and things that we can leverage to help us gain those efficiencies. And I know that you have spent a lot of time recently interacting with my new best friend, chat GPT. Yes. Yes. I'd love to hear from you, you know, why the early adoption and what you're doing and how that led to your new book. Well, thank you. You know, I, I, early on, I used to say, well, computers can't be creative or programs can't be creative. And of course, as soon as I, I was aware of the a generative AI programs, I say, I don't know how you want to define creativity, but boy, they sure seem creative to me. And so in my world, I'm saying, well, how do we the way I think of it is, you know, because there's some negatives, right? You know, the inaccuracies and plagiarism and all the, you know, taking over the world and, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to kill us and all the rest. But, but you know, the way I think of it is that, you know, the genie is out of the bottle and it's incumbent on all of us to figure out how to wish better is, is the way I think of it, right? And so I adopted it, you know, as an early adopter, just using this and what are the ways I can be creative with this? Because you know, if you're running ideation sessions, on the one hand, and and but now we're we're doing even more training work. But but if you're still you know still running ideation sessions, you say, well, what do you need you for, right? And so my work has been to really figure out how to mash up all the experience we have in ideation process and different techniques, whether it's you know, we, we've identified four categories of ideation techniques, you know, metaphors or principal transfer and questioning techniques and visual techniques and fantasy techniques. And, and there are, you know, dozens of techniques within each of those categories. How can we mash those up with AI 
and come up with you know, even better ideation sessions that are more productive than they ever were. And so that's been part of our research. And that's been so much fun. Oh my gosh. If you want, I'll tell you a quick story about that. I don't know. Yeah. We were asked by a snack food company, not, not Mondelez. We had done Oreos and Chips Ahoy work with them very successfully. You know, Brownie Chips Ahoy, if you haven't tried it, they're great. Uh, but, but, you know, we were asked by this other snack food company to generate ideas. And I went into that, you know, I had, it was a, a two day session. I, I had a lot of different techniques, but I also used AI with triggers. So I said, here are 400 flavor oriented snack ideas. What can you do with those generated by chat GPT? Or here are 400 flavor ideas or form ideas, excuse me, whichever I said before, what can you do with that? And so you know, a key to our work is stimuli, right? So if you look at ChatGPT as creating that stimuli, you still have to be creative and make those creative connections. But boy, if you can run that and use it, you're, 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 it's, you're exponentially greater and faster and better in terms of the number and quality of ideas you're creating. So if we go back to your question, though, <laughs> which was... How did it lead to, to your, actually, there are two AI books now. AI, I shouldn't call them AI books. They're AI assisted. And I spent a tremendous amount of cura curation time, you know, working these things, right, to get the books. The first one, which came out in March, is Quirks. And that one, I identified quirks of famous people. And so, you know, Abraham Lincoln was a trash-talking wrestler which is true, you know, or, you know, uh, John Quincy Adams wanted to dig to find mole people. That's true. And so, and so there, <laughs> there's some wonderful, you know, quirky things that great people in history do. And the reason I was interested in that, because the research I've done about great people and great innovators and great disruptors, right, is that they have to be willing to consider crazy ideas, really crazy ideas. You know, Tesla wanted to, and not, and this one isn't even that crazy. You know, Tesla wanted to try to photograph thoughts on the red knob of the eye. Is that a good idea or is that a bad idea? I don't know. I mean, that's a really interesting idea. So, so, so with Quirks, I, I, I used AI to create, you know, write a song about George Washington, who, who was a whiskey entrepreneur, very successfully, write a song about his whiskey or an ad for his whiskey or, you know, or an essay or whatever, a print ad or, or a radio commercial. And so that's that's what the first book, Quirks, was all about, using AI to, to take that quirk that I had researched and discovered and create these fun, you know, create a poem about that quirk, et cetera, et cetera. So that was book one. I'll pause. Uh, should, should well, and let's let's talk about yeah. book two and jump in yeah. because it's it was released in July. Quotes yeah, book, and book, book two, yeah, yes, yeah. just featuring just, you know. forty-one quotes from famous thinkers. Yes, yes, and then not only letting them tell us a little bit about what that quote meant to them, but then having other famous thinkers respond to that quote. Yeah, how much fun is that, right? I mean, I just love this. I, I sort of said, you know, after Quirks, I said, I, I want something, you know, pieces that I could build chapters around, right? And so I said, well, you know, in quotes are so great, and yet I always forget them, you know? And so is there some way that I can dimensionalize these quotes to make them more, more memorable, more profound, and to push us all, including myself, to think much deeper about a quote than just the quote. And to your point, so then, you know, I have a short biography of the person that said it. I, I asked them through AI, why did you say that? You know, and I, I did a lot of curation, finally picking an essay that I liked that, you know, that came out of ChatGPT or whatever. And then, then to your point, I said, well, you know, you know, the Eisenhower quote, and, and most of the quotes are you will not have heard of in the book, but there's there are a few that you might have heard of. So one of them was, uh, you know, the famous quote from Eisenhower, which was, you know, it's not, it's not about the, the plan, it's the planning, right? You know, and 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 the and of course, you know, the Mike Mike Tyson quote, you know, your plan, you know, changes pretty quickly as soon as you get punched in the mouth, right? So so I said, okay, I I had Eisenhower talk about that quote, but then I said, okay, let me think of someone who would 
who would not want to do planning? And so I picked Jackson Pollock, right? I mean, he's, you know, throwing paint against the wall. He's not, but, but what came out of the AI prompt, which was so cool and so fascinating, was that he said, he said, quote, you know, there's a tremendous amount of psychological preparation I do before I go into the state of throwing paint on the wall or on the canvas. And so that was a profound insight, I thought, that that I got from, you know, from from AI and 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 AI's understanding of his life and 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 his process. So and then the final thing I'll say that I think is the by the way, on the back of that book, I'm sure you've seen, I had famous people in history talk about why they thought it was a great book, right? <laughs> Generated by AI, of course. So Fred Rogers says, Quotes is a beautiful day in the neighborhood of wisdom. Won't you be its reader? I mean, you know, it's so much fun, right? So, but but the thing I'm most proud of about quotes is then I said, okay, AI, I'd like you to generate some exercises that will make this quote come to life. And so what can we do to live? I know you were interested in the Disney quote, you know, ideas come from curiosity. Um, what are some exercises we can do to live that quote? And that, to me, is one of the greatest contributions of this book. And I and I would look at hundreds and hundreds of recommended exercises, and I'd pick the top five or 10 or 12 that I thought were original and fun and unique and profound. And we'll dig into it a little bit. But yeah. one of the things about what was created in this, in the book, there are 350-ish actionable yes. exercises that yeah. people can use to be more creative, to ideate, to learn to in my right, to simply think differently. Yes. And I facilitate ideation sessions. I facilitate all sorts of different things. And to come up with 350, they're not necessarily all brand new ideas, but right to have that pool of those and the thousands I'm sure that you actually looked at. Yes. Chat GPT created that and consolidated that down for you in minutes, maybe well, hours, well, but not days, weeks, or months. It created it in minutes. And I spent all the time going through the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds to pick the ones that were originally unique and wonderful. So it was a true partnership. I consider these programs as sort of your brain, the ultimate brainstorming partner, right? But But people have to understand that, you know, a big part of this book is me. Frankly, even though you know I'm I'm editing and and picking and selecting and all the rest, but but it's a partnership is, is the ultimate way to think of it. I think, and I think that that's the fun part of looking at because everybody's talking about AI, right? What is it doing for plagiarism in school, and what does it mean to teachers? What is it? You know, the first step with something new is to use it and to learn and to test and to experiment. Yes, and or, the same way or, we do, and or freak out about it. Yes. <laughs> right. I'd rather try not to freak out unnecessarily. Yes. <laughs> right. But, but to explore that capability that it is giving us at our fingertips, the ability to synthesize through mountains of data and based on our triggers, give us things that should be pretty close to being actionable for our needs. Yes. I couldn't agree more. I think that's so well said, Lisa. I'm, I'm so glad you said that. You know, the, the other thing I want to say about ChatGPT that I think is so wonderful is that it it allows you as a teacher, and we are we are doing so much more teaching now of this, of sharing our processes in AI and 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 you know, I'm teaching at, you know, Caltech Executive Ed and TCU and other places, which is it's so rewarding to to do that work. And by the way, if there's an executive ed listener out there that wants me to work with your college or university, I'm happy to to do that. But but what's what what I think is so extraordinary besides the ideas is that you can now present information the 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 material you want to teach, you can present it in different modalities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if 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 a person will get it by hearing it in a song or a poem or, you know, a TV commercial or an ad or what or a sonnet, it doesn't, it's fantastic. And 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 the fact that you can now present information in so many different ways to me is going to open up the world of teaching in such extraordinary and wonderful and beautiful ways. Because I, I tell a story in 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 one of the books where 
I, I mean, do you know Sandy Alderson? He was uh, just an unbelievable guy if you look at the history, but he he was behind Moneyball, you know, and with the Oakland A's, and then he became the general manager for the Mets, and he's a, he's a Dartmouth guy. So he came to an event in Connecticut, and I was there, and my son at the time was a pretty good player. He was going to the World Series with the Stanford All-Stars, right, at 14 and under. So I said to James, I said, James, do you want to, is there anything you want to ask the general manager of the Mets, you know, about baseball? And James, by the way, was a philosophy, became a philosophy major at UConn and is now a pilot. So he's a really interesting guy. Anyway, James said to me, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to know how they identify, how they identify those guys in the minor leagues that they think could succeed in the major leagues. I thought, what a great question, right? And so I asked Sandy Alderson that when I, when I saw him at the event, and his his answer so surprised me. He said, one of the major things we look for is the ability of the players to learn mm -hmm. because we have so much to teach them. And I thought, oh my God, that is such a great comment and thought. But then I have a friend who, who teaches the inner game of tennis. He's the only certified inner game of tennis, Sean Browley, the Galway book. And I said to him, I told him that quote, and he said, wow, that's fascinating. But have you considered also their ability to teach, right? And so not only is it their ability to learn, but how good are they at teaching? And this leads us full circle back to your AI that AI, I think, can all make us better teachers by presenting information in di for different modalities, whether you're a visual thinker or, a, or an auditory thinker or, or a, you know, whatever it is, kinesthetic uh, thinker, you can you can involve those different modalities and succeed in a much bigger and broader and better way in your teaching, I think. I think that's absolutely a fabulous kind of closure to some of the things that we've been thinking about it, taking us through the ideation in through, right? We have to learn. And then after we learn, we have to apply and that is teaching. Yes, yes. And so that really encompasses our entire conversation in like a sentence. I don't know I've ever summarized that effectively before. Well, you know, and I, I you know, the you, you may have noticed that uh, I dedicated this quotes book to my daughter who has now gotten her second master's. She's she's found her way now. She work, used to work for, for, for a learning organizational design company, but she now knows and she's gotten her second master's in teaching. And that's her life's work and life's mission. And so I dedicated the book to her, but the quote I put under that, you know, it's for Catherine. The quote was, because all the great ones teach. And anytime I hear that, it kind of gives me goosebumps because I think it's true. Anybody who is great, in my opinion, whether they're a teacher or a politician or a social worker or Mother Teresa, all the great ones do teach and it, it, by their beingness, by the things they say, by the ideas they share with the world. So I, I agree with you. I, I think it's, uh, well, this is your show, but I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful, you know, tying up the bow for the way to think about AI and its potential. Well, and, and in that earlier in the conversation, we, I, I will say it, that you were poking fun at some of the big consulting organizations. Yes. I probably, I take great pleasure in doing that myself. Well, and so I, I, I've, worked, I've worked with these guys and I still work with these guys. And actually, there's a McKinsey guy. I've just written a co-written a book that's going to come out in the fall. It's called Islands of Invention, How to Create an Extraordinary Innovation Center. So I, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> I think we have to be able to poke fun at the big guys, right? OK, because, good. Thank you. Right there, there's there's there are things that they do. And for large businesses, those things are very valuable. The yes. point you made earlier is that every process isn't a one size fits all and being able to create the bespoke offerings that your clients need is really important. Yes. To, from my perspective with my clients, one of the things that I love to do is that we are working with them, right? We are building their skills, their capabilities towards a goal that I call self-reliance. But right. with this thing, right, the teaching, right? It, they have to learn and do. Otherwise, there's an unnatural dependence on a consultant, on an external that isn't in their best interest of their business. And so I really love how we took from ideation to experimentation to application and adding that last piece in where we're teaching. I think that that's a full journey that's really impactful. Well, thank God, I have such a profound comment, Lisa, I think, because 
you know, it, it gets back to our own motivation as consultants. I mean, we're we're here to help them succeed. And, you know, you can help them with new products, but at the end of the day, you really have to empower them to do this work themselves. And so you should really figure out how to, you know, work yourself out of a job. Not that you wouldn't always be able to contribute down the road, but I we've always felt that way. We want we want to empower them to do their best work. You know, and and if and if that means and we've recommended that, you know, we get fired at times because, you know, we we know that they've launched and that they are, you know, they, they are they've got their wings now and they can go do this stuff themselves. We're available to help along the way. But but I, I feel strongly I, I agree. I couldn't agree more with you that uh, you call it self-reliance. Is that how you thought? Yeah, I, I love that. So thank you. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Brian, I have loved this conversation. You and I could probably sit and continue to do this for hours on end and share stories and, and dig into the different aspects of the power that we drive in business and in the world around us through innovation. Thank you for being here with me today. Oh, it was, you know, it was so much fun, Lisa. You were so open. I went on and on at times, but you were very kind to let me tell these stories. And, you know, whenever I do these with a really great interviewer like yourself, I I learned something. So, so thank you for that. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. My pleasure. And for my audience, remember, don't get left behind. Join me next time. That's it for today's episode of Disrupt and Innovate. Head over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Every single week, one lucky listener that posts a review on iTunes will win the grand prize drawing, a $15,000 private VIP day with Lisa Levy. And be sure to head over to disruptandinnovate.com and get your free copy of Lisa's gift. And join us on our next episode.